Greetings, this is Steve Joel, superintendent of Lincoln Public Schools, coming to you with the final message of, of the school year. Hard to believe as, as we sit here in this great setting that in three or four days, uh, we will uh, have marked the end of another successful academic year for all uh, 36,000 plus students. This weekend also signifies a, a joyous event. It's graduation weekend, also happens to be Memorial Day weekend. And we anticipate our great crowds at our various ceremonies as we, uh, we, we take a, a hard look back at the accomplishments of our students and our staff and certainly in conjunction with our, with our great community. You know, the results in, in Lincoln, as we've articulated many times before, have, uh, have been outstanding. Our student achievement results continue to uh, grow and prosper. Our graduation rate continues to go up. We had a very significant increase in our graduation rate this year, and we don't believe that we're done yet. We think that our strategic plan is going to continue to have us focusing on more and more of our students graduating uh, in, in four years on time. We, uh, we also have uh, uh, just other opportunities to celebrate success, as we've shared. We've been able to, to produce these kind of results in, a, in an environment that's been a little bit challenging. You know, we, we began this year talking about budget. Budget was a little little tense, a little tight. Uh, we managed to, to make our way through. We had to freeze staffing points for um, probably a second or third year in a row. Um, our growth continues to be rapid. We, have, uh, we had about 600 more students this year than we had the previous year. We anticipate uh, some similar growth, a little bit of a drop off, but next year continuing in, in growth mode. And of course, demographic challenges. You know, we, we continue to be a district that is beginning to look more and more like the rest of the country. But we know that the success of our achievement results and the success that our school district enjoys truly centers on the, the great professional quality that's represented in all of our uh, various categories throughout Lincoln Public Schools. You know, we have great teachers, we have great teachers uh, support staff, we have wonderful volunteers. There's just so many opportunities for, for people to come to Lincoln and be part of a system that really makes a difference. Um, this is also the time of the year, speaking of people, where we, uh, in, in, in sadly and, and uh, with, with great reverence and, and, and thanks, say goodbye to, to folks that have made such, dedicated their careers and have made such a difference in the lives of our, of our children. I have with me today, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm very, very pleased to introduce them to you, two of our finest leaders that have dedicated uh, entire careers with Lincoln Public Schools and have been here for uh, th those days when uh, education probably seemed a lot simpler back, <laughs> uh, back then than it is today. But nonetheless, they've made their mark. They, they're leaving a tremendous legacy. They'll be greatly missed. But what I appreciate the most about uh, these two uh, fine leaders is their, uh, their willingness to put the school district above almost everything else in their lives. And, and we have a great deal to show for that. So uh, I'd like to introduce to you two, two folks that I've had a chance to work with uh, very closely. I've admired and respected their work. And uh, we want to get to know them a little bit as they, as they sunset their LPS careers and, and begin to look at new horizons. Um, first is Dr. Marilyn Moore, who's uh, an associate uh, superintendent for, for instruction, and uh, Dr. Barb Jacobson, who's uh, director of curriculum and, and staff development. So let me start with, uh, with Marilyn and just you know, pose this question, and it'll be the same question for both of you. What, tell us about your journey. How, how did it all begin, and where are you today? Well, I'm, from the time I was in elementary school, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. I've always wanted to be a teacher played teacher when we played school. I remember doing that at family gatherings. So I've always wanted to be a teacher. And, and that's what I am. Through every position I've been, been in, I've just always looked at it as being a teacher. Sometimes the students were middle school students, and sometimes the students are um, adults. But I'm fortunate to have always been a teacher. I started my teaching career as a middle school teacher. And one of the things I loved about it is that the middle school where I taught, which was Goodrich, was the school where Barb's students came. She was a teacher at Belmont. So I got to know Barb first by what her students said when they came to me, and they absolutely loved her. They just talked about how wonderful Miss Ramsey was, and then after she was married, how wonderful Mrs. Jacobson was. So I knew Barb first by what her students say, and you know, there's not much better recommendation than what your students say, especially when you're talking with fifth, sixth, seventh graders, because they're blunt and honest, <laughs> and they don't say it if it's not true. So that was, that was wonderful. I love being a middle school teacher, and I think teaching in a middle school is one of life's best preparations for almost anything that can happen any place in life after that. Then I had the good fortune to be in a number of leadership positions, and um, 
as you know and many in this community know I'm finishing 25 years in this position it's been an absolutely fabulous career can't imagine better work at all well and I want you to know and I want the public to know you know you're still a teacher and you'll always be a teacher because you've taught me a lot in the last two yeah. years I appreciate that you've been a, you've been a willing learner, I'm a, willing learner. <laughs> a highly motivated learner <laughs> a bunch to learn in Lincoln I know that Barb? Well, as Marilyn said, it's kind of in your blood. Um, I have a long legacy of educators in my family. My grandfather was a county superintendent and superintendent of schools for years and years and traveled all over Nebraska. Uh, one of my grandmothers was a teacher. My mother taught in Lincoln and also then went to the university as a professor down there. So it was kind of a normal route for me to think about going into education and, and have never regretted that. I uh, started, as Marilyn just said, at Belmont and taught also at Hawthorne Elementary School, which is, by the way, where I went to school. So that was very interesting mm -hmm. to come back to a school that you had gone to and be a teacher there. And there were still um, some teachers there that were there when I went to school. <laughs> so I'm sure they were a little surprised and maybe a little, oh my gosh, how did she make it through? <laughs> but, um, and then went on to do work in administration, started, uh, was an AP at um, Prescott and moved up to the principal of Prescott and then had the good fortune of opening Cavett School and, and Dorcas Cavett had been one of my professors at the university and so there was already a connection there and it was wonderful to renew that connection and, and have her be there for the first day and then also just for the days after and she loved going to Cavett School. And then um, 12 years ago came into this position and thinking that my career has really helped me think about how do you teach at, as Marilyn said, at all different levels and different audiences. And so I think we truly are always teachers at heart. So, so tell us, Barb, uh, just a little bit about what, what exactly is your assignment? What, what, what's your primary responsibility? <laughs> well, I'm the Director of Curriculum and Professional Development, so that means that I am in charge of all the curriculum K-12. Uh, I have um, curriculum specialists uh, for all content areas who really do the bulk of the work, but I just make sure we're all going down the same road together and uh, being aware of what the research says, what best practices are, knowing what the state and national st standards are, and now talking about Common Core. So we really look at what do our students uh, need to know and be able to do. Then along with that, the instructional strategies, the best practices for how to teach those curriculum areas, the assessment that goes with that, helping working with our assessment and evaluation department to make sure that we have assessments that help us know how our students are doing, and then providing that um, all-important professional development. And then there's lots of things <laughs> that go along with that, such as grading, report cards, developing new report cards, um, just all, just a wide variety of different projects to do too. And Marilyn, you know, in, in addition to keeping me out of hot water, why don't you describe <laughs> what you're primarily responsible for? I, I, I'm responsible for uh, all that is that happens to our students in, in, in instruction in the district. Um, everything uh, from um, Barb's area of what do we teach and how do we teach to the areas of special education, student services, library media services, gifted programming, um, the, the activities and athletics program, and then the supervision of the principals through our uh, directors of elementary and secondary ed, school improvement processes, accreditation, making sure that we're in line with that. The instruction budget is 82% of the total budget. And um, as I said to my mother, who was a little appalled when she found out how much money I was in charge of in the district, you know, the rule's the same with your home checkbook. It's that whatever money you have, you can spend that, but no more. <laughs> and the difference is if you spend more than that in the district, you go to jail instead of just getting an overdraft <laughs> notice from, from your bank. So we're pretty careful about not overspending that budget. It's, a, a, you know, it's, it's just truly it's wonderful to work with such great colleagues and, and um, to assure that our students have quality experiences and, and that they learn. And I, if there's anything that's changed, well, a lot has changed in the years we've been doing this. A whole lot has lot changed. Things. But I think um, 25 years ago, we put a lot of emphasis on trying lots of new things and doing new things. And there, the, the literature was full of new implementations mm -hmm. and new innovations. Um, that has shifted from doing new things to doing those things that are best, those things that are best at bringing about student learning and for all of our learners in, in all of the different content areas. So there's a much higher focus on being precise about our outcomes and about um, aligning our resources to bring about those good outcomes. You know, you know that, that, 
I have to ask this question because after two years, I, I, I've, I know that there are competing pressures here. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's a lot of pundits out there, not only in, in Lincoln, but in <laughs> Nebraska and across the country that have the solution for education. Exactly. You know, we get yeah. criticized a lot because we use tax mm -hmm. dollars. Mm -hmm. How have you managed over the years to stay the course? Because I think if there's one thing that impresses me the most, it's the staying true to the mission. So, mm -hmm. Marilyn, start with you. Well, I'm, I, think, I think we've managed to stay the course because those faces of those students are always right in front of us. And um, if, we're, if we're not true to the course, we're not true to them. And, and that's our ultimate accountability. That's where I feel my ultimate accountability is, is to those 36,000 plus students who have one shot at kindergarten. And we need to make kindergarten the best it can be. So I, I think keeping students in mind and, and running everything through the filter of um, what does the research say about this? Is this the best practice? Is this something that truly improves student learning? And if the answer, if there's not a firm answer to that, then it's not something we're going to look at very carefully because our mission is so clear. And the biggest resource we have is student time, and it's so limited. We, we can't... Um, we can't be frivolous with it, so we have to make the best use of it. Excellent. Thank you, Barb. Yeah, I think, yeah, Barb. I, I would agree with that. It's very well said. I, I think that one of the things that has changed in that has held us to that truth is to be sure that we have a guaranteed and viable curriculum throughout the school district, that what's taught in one classroom is taught in another classroom, and it doesn't matter whether it's down the street, across town, or even next door, that we know that all of our students are going to get the same resources, the same curriculum, have the same, basically some of the same assessments. Um, the teachers are going to get the same professional development, so we have teachers that are thinking and doing the same kinds of things and know what the, the best practices are, which ultimately goes back to what Marilyn just said is about keeping those kids in front of us. So I think that as we have really worked over the last 12, 15 years, to make sure that what happens in all of our schools is research-based, is uh, looking across what national and state um, experts say and what our, those standards are, I think has really helped us. And you do have to ward off all of the magic answers. And you have to think about, really, as Marilyn said, what is the best thing for kids? So let's talk about the best thing for kids. I mean, one of the things that impresses me um, immensely here is the training that our professionals have participated in. I, mm -hmm. And I think, quite frankly, based on interactions I've had with superintendents around the country, we're, we're, we're probably second to none in terms of what we do. But the public doesn't always understand that. And, and you work in that field, and mm -hmm. we're coming off uh, yet, yet another calendar adoption. And invariably, the question is, why do we have so many days off? What are these PLC days? What are these stat mm -hmm. development days? Speak to that for a second. Uh, what, what difference has that made in mm -hmm. teaching and learning? I think that what you've seen over the last few years really has been that teachers are becoming much more collaborative, much more um, looking at what the data says about what kids are able to uh, know and be able to do. And because of that collaboration and because of that time that we've gotten now with PLC days, um, some of the other opportunities uh, throughout the school year for teachers to actually sit down and have conversations about how is this working in your classroom? What are you doing? I see that your kids are doing better at this concept than my kids are. What are you doing? And then being able to come to the district and, say, and seek the expertise that is at the district level in the curriculum specialists, in our teacher leaders, our coaches, and say, you know, we're having trouble with this. What can you do to help us? And for us to then sit down with them on a school basis, on a department basis, on a fourth grade team basis, and say, let's take, let's take an opportunity and really have those conversations about what's happening in your classrooms. So this really has individualized, I think, professional development for both teachers and teams of teachers, whereas it used to be a kind of a scattershot, oh, here's the, again, the next best thing, let's all go out and learn this, and let's try this in our classrooms. I think we really are starting to bring it back down to what's the best thing for kids, and what's happening in your classroom, and what do you need to be that better teacher that will help your kids learn.
Oh. You know, I, I just liken it a lot to other professional areas. I know that um, some members of the community might say, well, you hire certificated teachers, they all have degrees, they're ready to teach, what, you know, why do they need further professional development? And in any profession, we want further professional development. I, there, there have been a lot of advances in the medical field since my physician graduated from medical school a number of years ago, and I expect him to know them all. And <laughs> likewise, and this is probably another significant change mm -hmm. in the time that we've been in the profession. There have been huge advances in research, research. on mm -hmm. how students learn, mm -hmm. on how the brain works, right. on how you engage a student's brain, on how you make connections between prior learning and new learning, and how do you set students up for success. And our teachers want to know that. They, they, more than anyone, want to be successful with students. They want to know the latest research. And one of the wonderful things about a district of this size is that we're able to we're able to gather that expertise and and to to put that together in a way that, that's accessible to teachers. So I th I think professional development is one of the most important things that we do for um, our very skilled teaching staff is is to make sure that every year there are very skilled teaching staff because they know they know the latest research and there's always a new and there's always new. I think just to add to that, I think we now start to talk about the art and science of teaching. Mm -hmm. It used to be the art of teaching, that you could go into a classroom and engage kids and have that charisma and kids would follow, but now there is that science of teaching like Marilyn mentioned. And so a, a good teacher knows the science behind teaching, but also has that art behind her as well, it, her or him as well. It was also that time when it was almost all science and no art. Art, yeah. Um, and, and that was when different organizations or companies would produce what they called teacher-proof material, yeah. which I think is about the most negative comment that could ever <laughs> be made, like uh, like you don't need a teacher for it. But now the research is really solid, that you need excellent instructional skills, you need excellent relationships with students, and when both of those are present, um, student outcomes are just extraordinary. And we, we see that over and over and over again. Well, and, and you know, that, that is endorsed in a, in a couple of different ways. One. Uh, most recently, it was with a group of teachers at a teacher advisory group where I said I asked the question, "What makes the difference here? I mean, why mm -hmm. is this the go-to place?" And they and they alluded to the training and the support that teachers have when they come here because it's not easy to teach. Mm -hmm. We have a no. community with right. the highest of expectations, yes, we do. Yes. Yes, and we, do. <laughs> we continue to meet them. And and so that that training piece is is important. And then I think you know, secondly, our leaders have have commented how you know their leadership is constantly being coached and and is evolving in its own right as well too. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, I've, I've followed your book studies over the years and, and uh, have just been very impressed with, with the, the selections that you've made in terms of helping people mm -hmm. expand their leadership capacity. Mm -hmm. So if, looking back over the years, think of a memory, think of a story, think of a, something that you know, is, is, is gonna be with you forever. And, <laughs> and I realize you probably have mountains of those, but is there, is there one that comes to mind that, that you'd wanna share that maybe just kind of defines the, the experience that you've had in Lincoln? Well, I don't know if it defines my experiences, but I think it defines me in a way because I can't go too many places in, out in public where I don't meet somebody, especially from Cabot, that doesn't remind me of this story. <laughs> so um, when you talk about building relationships with kids and getting kids excited about learning, uh, when I started at Prescott, um, somehow we would have picnics out on the on the front lawn and everybody and parents would come and we'd all do that and I would always get up and lead a cheer called the Prescott Pause Cheer and uh, positive actions working for success and I had I'd been somewhere on some campus and found these big paws and so I would get up and do the pause and so when I went to Cavett, I decided we needed to continue that tradition. And so we came up with the Cardinals Can Do Cheer. And so we would have those picnics. And um, I'm not very good about peer pressure. And so one time when we were having a picnic, one of my colleagues said to me, I bet you can't at the end of your cheer do a cartwheel. And I said, you're right, I can. And she said, oh no, you can do it, you can do it. And so to prove her that yes I could do it I did the cardinal can do cheer and I did a cartwheel wow. of which my father said afterwards <laughs> and how old are you Barbara <laughs> <laughs> and anyway I, I cannot go anywhere in Lincoln when I don't run into a parent or a student that asks me if I can still do a cartwheel of which I can't 
But what I, the reason I remember that is because all those little things you do to build community in a school and as an educator really make a difference. And sometimes just doing something as small as that brings everybody together. It makes it the school, the place that kids want to be, the p place that parents want to send their kids. And it, it just um, sort of has defined Cabot and some of the things I did there. So. How long were you hospitalized? <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say I was a little sore. <laughs> <laughs> Marilyn, how about you? You know, I don't turn cartwheels. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any story that's as dramatic as that. I've, there, are, there are, of course, lots of them, many, many from teaching. Uh, when you're a middle school teacher, you have a story a day, and sometimes <laughs> several stories a day. And then uh, when I worked in our human resources department, I discovered that there were lots of stories too, but because of confidentiality rules, you can't tell any of them. So five years of great stories that, that will never be said and never be shared. I've, you know, there, there are many, again, from this work. I do remember um, the, the summer that we had worked so hard to put in, plan, to put in place a new plan to deal with, um, with reading in the elementary schools, especially reading in the primary grades, because the... The, our performance, it didn't meet community expectations and it didn't meet our expectations. So we'd worked really hard on a new plan. And that fall, uh, at the start of the school year, we had a voluntary um, all staff meeting for anybody who wanted to come. And uh, it, it, we used to have required first day of school staff meetings for the whole staff when we'd fill the gym at East High School and, and we decided there was a better way to use our time. So then we had a voluntary meeting again at East High School in the auditorium, and we really had no idea how many people would come, but hundreds of people came, and I think part of it was because people had felt really pressured all summer long and had felt kind of beat up by the, by the newspaper stories about the, about the reading scores. And so hundreds of people came, and they came dressed in their school t-shirts, so you know, we had all the Cabot teachers in their Cabot t-shirts, and we had all the Mickle teachers in their Mickle t-shirts sitting in the East High Auditorium. And um, I remember speaking to that group. I really don't remember what I said, um, other than reminding them of what fine professionals they were and um, the plans that we had and the confidence that we, that we as leaders all had that by doing their, our, our professional best practices that there would, be, um, there would be improved student learning. And of course, over the course of the next year, there was improved student learning. But that morning, that was kind of, it kind of felt like we turned a corner from a summer of being pretty beat up to a start of a new school year, which is always wonderful. When you start a new school year, you truly get a fresh start, and not only for kids, but for adults too. And it felt like, okay, we're, we're here, we're all together, we're committed to this, we are a great big professional learning community gathered together in this auditorium, and we're determined to move this forward. And it had an absolutely wonderful feel to it. So when I, I, when I'm out in the community, I don't have parents who ask me if I can turn cartwheels because <laughs> they know I can't. But I do have teachers that, that just comment on how important it is every now and then to come together, hear a common story, and, and, and take a deep breath and, and get ready to move forward to the new year. So that's probably illustrative of that. You might not do cartwheels, but I've heard you were one heck of a softball player. Well, there is that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when yeah. you, le le leadership is is really all encompassing, and there's, um, my, 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 I suspect in Lincoln many more ups than downs, but you know, downs mm -hmm. come with it as mm -hmm. well too. Think back to what's challenged you the most over the years, and maybe continues to challenge you. Well. Marilyn bringing up the, um, the reading scores. I was the principal at Cabot then. And I remember when the, the newspaper came out that morning and um, looked at the scores in the paper. It was, I also remember it was Mother's Day. And I remember going to church and sitting in the balcony and really almost crying because I was just so upset that, um, first of all, that we hadn't done better but yet I had thought we were doing a pretty good job. And so I, I think that what that said to me was that even though I thought we were doing a pretty good job, we can always do better. That there's always the next hill to climb, there's always that next goal to reach, and that we can't rest on our laurels. Because at Cabot, we could, our kids could read. I mean, they, we didn't have very many kids that couldn't read. We had some kids that had some difficulties, but it really made me think about 
there's always another goal to reach. There are always some kids that need that extra help. There are always, there's always something to do. And so you can't sit back and say, well, we did a good job. So I, I think that that really reminds me all the time that we keep needing to go down the road and, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, looking forward. I think the challenge is one that you, that you mentioned earlier. You talked about being impressed with how focused we are and how true we've stayed to mission. Uh, that's not easy. There are, there are lots of distractions to that. There are distractions from, as you said, from vendors or from national critics who, who always have, an, ha, have another idea or a better plan, but there are distractions in our own district. When you're a growing district, it's easy to be distracted by the fact that we need to open a new elementary school almost every year just to keep up with the growth and to be distracted by drawing attendance lines and setting attendance ba boundaries and just managing the growth. And then, uh, you know, what, whatever else it is that comes up, and there's something that comes up every day, and, and it would be easy. It, it, we have to work, I have to work really hard to stay focused and to, um, to remind everyone that, that our focus needs to be not on those management tasks, but our focus needs to be on, on what we're doing and why we're doing it and how do we know that we're doing it well. I think that's a huge challenge. I think the other one, which is a fun challenge, but one that's really important, is the development of new leaders. Um, this year we have 16 administrative retirements and um, 14 of those positions have been filled by people from within the district um, and some transfers that have created new ones, but, but ultimately 14 of those positions filled by people within the district. And so the, the, the task of growing new leaders is a, is, a very, is a very real one. And we have to be really, really intentional about that because um, leadership matters. It, it, it makes all the difference in the quality of a system. You can have quality teachers sprinkled throughout the district, but if you don't have quality leadership pulling it all together into a system, it's not as powerful as um, as it would be so that's we just have to keep growing leaders and you've you've done a tremendous job of that those 14 um, administrators that are moving up within the district have been touched by both of you in a very very positive mm -hmm. way you know leadership and and leaders are often um, not defined by how well they do when times are good <laughs> but as as you alluded to sitting in the balcony at church and you know, the idea that, you know, wow, what are you going to tell your staff on that mm -hmm. Monday? Because, right. it, and I remember I was superintendent of Beatrice yeah. at the time, and I thought, okay, I'm going to learn a lesson here. How does leadership respond to that? And right. I, thought the, I thought the LPS administrative response to that was picture perfect. So we get defined by how well we, we respond when, when times mm -hmm. are tough. Um, probably nothing tougher than the fire. <laughs> and, and you both played critical roles as, as district leaders. Talk about that a little bit. What was the, what was your, what, personally, how, how was that to, to work through it? And, and I understand we, we all had to have that face of encouragement mm -hmm. and, you know, we're going we're gonna <laughs> to get through this. But right. I, I lost a year's worth of stuff. Yeah. And, and it was all replaceable. You lost lots That's and lots of years of stuff and memories. So, Barb, we'll start with you. How'd you, how'd you really respond to that? I think I responded um, like I, thought I should. In other words, you know, I was a leader and like you said, you put the face on and you toughed it out and you were the cheerleader and you were the person that people came to cry on, cry on your shoulder and you were the people that said, we can do this and just organizing uh, my department back, getting them back together. Um, so for a long time, I really went kind of just on all my good instincts and all of the things that I knew you, a good leader did and all the things you had to do. And it probably wasn't until about July when it dawned on me that what had really happened and really had to take a couple of days to sit back and really reflect on all the things you'd lost and all of the things that were going to be different. And um, I could tell physically at that point that I really needed to to step back from it because um, it, it, my body was telling me that you're at, you're at that peak. But you did lose a lot of things. Um, you lost, personally, mementos. I still today think back and can see my office and think back of the little statue of a little child that someone had given me on some occasion. Um, I can see the awards that I had on my walls. Um, 
I can see the pictures that people had given me when I left Prescott. Uh, when I got my doctorate, they'd given me some lovely pictures. When someone had quilted, made me a quilt. But also just all the professional things. Um, every conference that you had been to, all of your notes, you didn't, you didn't use those every day. But there were days when you'd be getting ready for a presentation, and I want to, oh no, I don't have that. And even today, there will be something that you will reach for or think about and go, I don't have that anymore. So as a leader, sometimes you didn't let yourself feel like we should have let ourselves feel at the beginning. And I think at the end, then all of a sudden you had to just kind of stop and let yourself feel for a while. And then you got back up on the horse and rode down the road again. So. Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's a real grieving process. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is that frenzy of activity that has to happen, and people in leadership roles do that. I mean, we're good at figuring out what's the problem to be solved, what are the options, what's the best one, make a choice, get on with it, implement, and go on to the next thing. And sometimes you have months to answer those questions, and sometimes you have a half an hour, which is mostly what we had last summer, was a half an hour to do that. And um, I'm so impressed with all of my colleagues. I, I think people, people made amazing decisions. They were amazing problem solvers. They figured out how to get things done. The, the summer may seem like a not very busy time to members of the community because we don't have students in school. But and hmm. from an instructional point of view, well, actually for all, all the departments mm -hmm. at the district office, summer is a very, very busy time. And everything that needed to happen, happened. We did all of the professional development. We did all of the teacher training. We processed all of the new textbooks that were coming in. We set up libraries. We packed up and moved libraries. Had um, summer school. We had summer school in, in multiple Most sites. Um, we hired teachers. We cleaned buildings. Every, everything that needed to happen, happened. And there was never any question about that. I don't think it occurred to any of us that school wouldn't start on time. Of course school would start on time. You have to start school on time. So there's that, there's that frenzy of activity, which is always true, which was made just much more difficult by being in such unfamiliar surroundings and without all of the, just without all of the, the documents and, and procedures and plans that, that normally take you through that. And then at the same time, there's that very, very um, real sense of grief, just a huge sense of loss. And part of it is, um, you know, part of it is personal and individual, and part of it is also collective. I mean, there's a collective sense of loss, a sense of loss of not being with each other, of being scattered across the community and not, not knowing at first even where different offices were. So even all of the, the normal communication channels were changed, and you had to figure out how to, how to do that. And it was wonderful when email came up again, but even that wasn't enough because you couldn't just walk down the hall and take the purchase order down to purchasing. You had to first of all, remember where they were, and then get it out to them, and, and if it was an emergency, drive it. And, and so every, every routine and procedure that we'd had well in place was disrupted and had to be recreated. And that's regenerative in some ways. It's also immensely exhausting. And then I, I think another hard part was, and we heard over and over and over again, you know, it, was a, it was a tragic fire, it was a huge fire, it was a, a, a tremendous loss, but thank goodness no one was hurt. And I thought, yeah, no, everyone was hurt. hurt. You know, no one was physically burned, but everyone was hurt, and and it's um, it's hard to hear the statement "no one was hurt" when you know that everyone was. So I I think there still is I'm um, healing going on internally. There's still grief going on. People are still I'm um, trying to reclaim whatever it is that was most important in that space, um, rebuild that, um, identify new things of importance because that's, that's just part of our work environment. So it's not, it's not over, and it won't be over when we move back into the new building. But with every month comes you know, some more piece that, that falls into place. And it's much like um, grief over the death of a, of a loved one. Um, with every month, there's a, a little more perspective and a little more time, and those are really good. And then you also figure out ways to stay in contact with the, the people that you work with most closely. We're, we're lots more efficient now than we were yeah. 10 yeah. months ago mm -hmm. in terms of knowing how to get our work done, even though we're not all in the same building. Mm -hmm. So that's been an important learning, and I, I'm sure everyone is stronger for it and more resilient because of it. Um, but I have to say, I think we saw great strength and great resilience on the part of, our, of all of our colleagues as we worked through that process. Well, I think you, you, you've absolutely nailed it. it it's one of those of, uh, <clears throat> events that mm -hmm. we'll always remember what we were doing and mm -hmm. 
I look back on it and it was a flurry of activity, mm -hmm. it was a lot of adrenaline, it was just mm -hmm. the human spirit of can do and we, we just got worked on. So, and, and you both provide a tremendous leadership for that. Okay, hearing you, you talk and, and watching your expressions and you're, you know, you're still smiling, you know, you're not the, he's burned out, you know, I, I gotta, I, it's time to retire and, and gotta, I, I'm gonna sleep till 10 o'clock, yeah, I'm gonna drink, you know, coffee till, till noon. What are your plans? And, and before you answer what are your plans, let, let me ask you this, what, what made you decide to retire? Barb? You know, I hadn't really thought about retiring, and people always said to me, you'll just know when it's time. And this year, it just kept creeping back into my thoughts. It was like, there has, is there something else out there that I want to do? And I'm still young enough, hopefully, to do that. And maybe it's time to let somebody else take the reins and move this forward. Have I, you know, the question always comes up, have you done what you can do? And is it now time to let someone else come in? Um, so it was just, as I said, it just kept creeping back in my thoughts and I thought apparently something or somebody is telling me that it's time to really look at this seriously. So um, it was a hard decision. It was very difficult. I love what I do. I love the people I work with. Um, I, I am not burned out. I have not once said at least aloud that this isn't going to be my problem anymore. <laughs> Uh, um, I plan on working up until till the last day of June 29th. So, so that's not the issue. I just think that you know, you know when it's time to say, is there something else out there? Is there something else I want to do? Are there some other adventures I want to have? And if I'm going to do it, maybe now is the time to do it. And so. what I know you've got some new adventures. Um, I'm going to be a professor at um, Doan College part-time, not all the time, so I can get up at 10 on some of those mornings <laughs> and drink coffee till noon on some of those mornings. But I'll be working in their um, graduate uh, studies in education and working with uh, their educational specialist program, which is people that are looking for their superintendent certificate, also developing some courses on how you work in a district so those people that may not want to be a superintendent but want to do some other um, opportunities in a district office or at, a, at that level um, developing some courses for that so I'm looking forward to that um, I'm looking forward to helping future leaders because we know we need them think about who they are and what their leadership is and how they're going to move forward so I'm and then just some other taking some trips my daughter lives in Indianapolis so opportunity to Go see her and just some some fun things. That flexible scheduling yeah, has to makes, be appealing yeah. because one of the things I know, um, I speak for all three of us mm -hmm. and everybody else for that matter, vacations are difficult yeah. And, yeah. and being able to do something on the on the go no, is right. really hard. No, so you're right, that flexibility of just saying, I think I want to do this and then try and then as you said in your schedule, it, it really doesn't work. Yeah. You can't really even take summer vacations because as Marilyn alluded to, summer is one of our busiest times, especially in curriculum and professional development. So it's very hard to get away for any length of time. Well, so. and when you're on vacation, you, you, you know, think about what's you think going Think about on. work. You know, That's you're getting right. all those emails. That's and phone exactly. Calls, you don't so. get away you from it. So. Well, I'm encouraged. You're going to be working to help develop and or identify yes. and develop yes. superintendents because you know one of the things I keep hearing from. Uh, my colleagues is that there's a real shortage. Yes. So, great. So, good luck with that. Thank Marilyn? you. Well, like Barb, I just knew it was time. There was not a, not a single incident, uh, not a, not anything that I could put on paper. I just knew it was time. And like Barb, I love the work and love the people, and um, I'm really glad to be able to say that. Uh, you know, totally, 100% uh, honestly, as I leave, I. I can't imagine doing this work without loving the work and loving the people. So I'm, 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 I'm not upset with anyone. I'm not disappointed in anyone. I, I just know it's, it's just time. And I'm, and I'm so proud of, of, of this district and where it is and all that's happened. And I will always be its best cheerleader, without a doubt. And um, I don't know what that first day will be like. I think it will feel like vacation. <laughs> and, and that will be wonderful. And, and it'll, for me, it'll be a couple of months of vacation. And then I'll start um, a new position as the president of the Brian, Brian LGH College of Health Sciences, which is totally new for me. I really don't know higher education. It wasn't what I was planning to do in retirement, but the opportunity came up. So I said, yes, I'll do that. So I'll be figuring out 
what it means to be a, a college president of a small college that is all persons pursuing um, degrees in, in different avenues of health professions, which is a very important aspect of our community. And so I'll be, I'll be glad to still be in teaching and learning just in a different setting. Absolutely, and, and you, you, obviously you both have a lot more uh, leadership left in you, <laughs> and, and that's going to benefit students <laughs> at, and, at higher education, which is certainly going to be a benefit to Lincoln and to the state of Nebraska. You know, it, it, level five leadership is defined by Jim Collins um, in his book, Good to Great, as what does the organization or the department or the, the, the corporation look like after great leaders depart. And, and one of the things that defines both Marilyn and Barb is that with their the replacements that, that have been identified and are coming in, Dr. Janie Miller is going to be our Director of Curriculum and Professional Development and Dr. Jane Statham from Blair, Nebraska is going to be uh, the Associate Superintendent for Instruction. They're gonna have an opportunity to, to really come to a, a great school district and, and have the keys given to them with, uh, with, with, a, with a roadmap that right now appears to be very, very clear and an and opportunity to continue that legacy. We're not in crisis. We're, we're, we're in control of our own destiny. Our numbers are, are very, very good. Uh, the, our, the results continue to be great. And it's, and it's due in large part to the leadership of not only Barb and Marilyn, but of, of all of the leaders that, that are represented in LPS and, and of all of our teachers and, and, and of the folks in the community that are our cheerleaders and our supporters. But, you know, that le level five is, is defined by what does it look like after you depart. And, you know, I, I can say with, with unqualified belief that uh, it's going to be as it was, as you would have wanted it to be. And, and so thank you so much you. for for both of uh, your tremendous contributions to uh, LPS Betterment, and we wish you the very best as, as you go. And you know, they both said this too. And, and you know, I was joking about the, you know, that every day is going to be a Saturday, and you know, wanting to go. Um, I know both of them are going to work right up until the last day. And, and in fact, Marilyn, you're going to be heading the, the school board meeting as, as I'm going to be out of town. So <laughs> you know, we're we're going to continue to get great value. But thank you for all that you've done, and thank you for helping your. Uh, your replacements begin that transition process and uh, they know they'll be able to contact you absolutely. at any time yeah, and you'll always absolutely. be a part of the LPS family. Both of these great leaders for Lincoln Public Schools while they're beginning to um, I'm, I'm sure focus a little bit about what the next phase of life is going to be um, will be working right up until the final day and, and certainly we would expect nothing less and in fact uh, Dr. Moore is going to be running the school board meeting, uh, the first meeting in June while I'm out of the, the state and actually out of the country. So uh, just another example of their dedication and their commitment. And I, I want people to know, and, and I know most of you have experienced that what Marilyn and Barb exemplify today truly is seen throughout the Lincoln Public Schools District in our teachers, in, in, in the folks that support instruction. Uh, Folks that, that come to Lincoln Public Schools really develop quickly a sense of mission and it becomes much more than a job. And it's that level of commitment that truly allows our leaders to set the stage for the greatness that's taking place in our classrooms and the education of our children. And it's what makes Lincoln a step above and, and something that you know, we are very, very proud of. And, and also as we continue to deal with the demographic changes and the rapid population growths and, and the higher ex community expectations and the greater accountabilities at the state and federal level, we know that it's, it's, going, to, it's going to rest with our people. And, and we're able to say very, very proudly that we attract top talent and we develop top talent. And, and we hold ourselves accountable. We don't need to be held accountable by anybody else. So with that, um, we, we would draw this to a conclusion. I, I would thank Marilyn and Barb for sharing some of their, their personal journeys and experiences, and once again, thank them for their tremendous contribution as they leave a great legacy. And to wish uh, all of our, our uh, retirees the very, very best of luck and a, and a heartfelt thanks to them for uh, their contributions to, to where we are today and a great big welcome to the, the folks that are going to be coming into the Lincoln Public Schools for the first time either from uh, college or uh, other locations or being promoted from within our district. 
you know, I, I, as superintendent of schools, of course, you know, we, we want to, I always think about maintaining the legacy of, of greatness, but uh, I am absolutely convinced that we have the folks to continue to do that. And we'll look forward to, uh, to continued positive results in the future. Uh, wish everybody a great summer. We were talking about uh, a message or two this summer from a, from a couple of select sites. We've got a lot of activity that's happening at LPSDO. We've got a groundbreaking next week that we're really excited about. It won't be long. We'll, be, we'll begin to see uh, what, what that new Lincoln Public Schools District Office is going to look like. So uh, from me to you, thank you for all your support, your commitment, your time and attention, and, and, and to the community for your willingness to roll sl your sleeves up and, and help us as we, uh, as we continue to advance this journey. Have a great summer. This has been a presentation of Lincoln Public Schools. A monthly programming guide may be found at www.lps.org.